we are going to discuss some of the uh, new advances in lung cancer, which there are quite a few. It's a, it's a disease that's kind of um, been one of the most exciting, I would say, in oncology in terms of the rapidity of change um, in all areas. And we're going to hear about radiology, surgery, um, medical oncology, that is drugs, um, and, radi and radiation oncology. And actually, I'm amazed as I sit here thinking about it, all of the advances there have been in just the last few years in each of our fields. Maybe surgery the least. Surgery is like from the Pleistocene now. <laughs> so uh, there are going to be four speakers. Um, the first is going to be Ann Leung. All of us are actually really the, I guess I hate to use the word senior, but we're sort of the senior people in our respective little uh, areas of lung cancer. So Ann Leung is our senior uh, radiologist who's a real expert in the radiology of lung cancer, and she's going to focus on screening for lung cancer, which is really a brand new thing. So thank you for coming. Thanks, Ann. So welcome to this talk. As you heard from Dr. Schrager, I'm going to be talking about lung cancer screening, which is a relatively new uh, test that we are performing in patients. So I want to start off with just giving some context. I know that you're, you are already a very knowledgeable audience, but let's just provide some background about this very, very important disease, lung cancer, which is the most common cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide as well as in the United States. And as you can see, the, the statistics, unfortunately, are, are very tragic. There are over 200,000 new cases per year that are diagnosed in this country and associated with a lot of deaths. Um, what is promising, though, and this is what I'm going to be talking about to you tonight, is really that there is a, a new test, low-dose CT screening, that has been found to be effective in reducing the likelihood of someone dying from lung cancer. And for this new test, which is performed in patients without any symptoms of cancer, there are an estimated 7 million high-risk Americans in this country who are eligible for CT screening. So let me just give you a little bit of background about this test and how it came to uh, come into medical practice. So approximately seven years ago now, in November 2010, there was an announcement from the National Cancer Institutes that national lung screening trial, which was a very, very large randomized trial of patients who either went an annual chest x-ray or a low-dose CT, what they found uh, is that this study showed that there was a mortality benefit from the individuals who were enrolled in the low-dose CT screening arm. Many years later, five years later, um, in January 2015, the US uh, Preventative Service Task Force, which is a body of experts who uh, recommend uh, certain tests be implemented into clinical practice, um, gave the recommendation that private insurers should provide coverage, medical coverage, for low-dose CT screening in a high-risk population. And then similarly, uh, later, later that same year, in February, um, the, the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid decided to provide coverage of low-dose CT screening for all Medicare beneficiaries, so for individuals 65 years and older. So who are the high-risk population that are eligible for this test? Well, it is currently defined as current or former smokers who have a 30-pack year smoking history, and if they've quit smoking, they would have quit within the past 15 years. The eligibility is 55 to 80 years of age. Having said that, though, um, Medicare will only cover folks up to 77 years of age. And as for all screening tests, patients should be asymptomatic. So one does not have any symptoms of cancer at that time. If, in fact, obviously one has symptoms of cancer, then one would get what we call a diagnostic test to try to find the cause for the symptom, but screening is for the asymptomatic population. And then in addition, in order to receive this test as a covered benefit, the patient should receive a written order for the test from the physician after their uh, referring physician discusses with them the risks and benefits of undergoing this exam. So if we look at low-dose CT as compared to other well-accepted screening tests, what we'll find is that the number needed 
to number needed to screen and save a life using low dose CT is on the order of 320 as compared to over 1,000 for mammography or around 800 for flexible sigmoidoscopy. And then in terms of the benefits and harms, obviously the potential benefit is if we detect cancer at an early enough stage, lung cancer at an early enough stage, we can reduce the likelihood of that individual dying from the disease. There are potential harms, false positives, I'm gonna talk a little bit about in the following slide. There are incidental findings, findings that we see that are not related to the purpose of the test, which is to find early stage lung cancer. Sometimes we can find uh, very, very indolent cancers that, that over the course of that individual are not gonna affect their quality of life or cause mortality, that's called overdiagnosis. And obviously a concern for many in the public is this idea that a CT exam, a so-called CAT scan, is associated with radiation exposure. Now these low-dose CT screenings, because they are to be done in high-risk individuals on an annual basis, they are performed in such a way that while they are diagnostic, we can see early stage cancers, they also minimize radiation dose. So if one were to undergo a low-dose CT, it is equivalent to how many months of just living in Palo Alto. Every day we, have, we uh, absorb radiation from, from space, from, from the ground, so there are many sources of radiation in the environment around us. And a low dose CT is equivalent to six months of living in Palo Alto. If you go up to Denver, where there, it's the mile high city, they're closer to cosmic radiation, it's even a smaller number of months from living in Denver. Now false positives. False positives are studies in which we see something and we say, well, that's possibly cancer. And in approximately one in six individuals who undergo that, this study, we will say, this is potentially cancer. However, what we found is that greater than 95% of those so-called positive studies will eventually prove to have benign disease. And the way that we differentiate benign from cancer is usually done by a non-invasive method. That is, we do follow-up imaging. And we really reserve invasive procedures such as biopsies, certainly such as surgeries, for situations in which we feel there's a very high likelihood of malignancy. And then how about lung cancer screening at Stanford? As I've already discussed with you, this is a physician-referred examination. It's done after the patient and the referring physician have a discussion about whether this study might potentially benefit them. And there are a number of online educational resources that are currently available for individuals who are interested in exploring this possibility. There's material online from the American Lung Association. There's a very good website which is entitled shouldiscreen.com from the University of Michigan that really talks about the risks and benefits of this procedure. And then there are uh, YouTube videos entitled CT Scan at Stanford in which one of the writers at Stanford, Sarah Wikes, um, she's, this is not violating any confidentiality agreement because she's willingly posted these videos talking about her ex screening experience at Stanford. But there's, uh, there's parts one, two, and three, each are about three minutes long if anybody cares to really understand what this process entails and really the decision making that is required to even decide to enter into this process. And then in terms of national screening, as you saw as of 2015, this was a covered, screen, this was a covered test. However, there is, like all screening tests, a very low rate of adoption, particularly at the start. And it's been estimated that 4% of those eligible actually got screened in 2015. This is due to a lack of knowledge amongst individuals, smokers who are eligible, and also, in honesty, doctors as to these relatively new screening recommendations, as well as a lack of access to high quality screening. Now we in California are extraordinarily fortunate because we have one of the lowest prevalences of smokers in the country. There's only one state that has a lower rate of smoking than California. Can anybody guess which state that is? Utah, Utah, that is correct. So we're the second lowest, but Utah is the lowest. 
And um, at Stanford, I would say we have a relatively modest screening program because we have relatively few smokers. We've done about 140 exams this year. And uh, up to November, we found two early stage cancers and one renal cancer. So that's the end of my talk. I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of this session. Thank you very much. So I'm going to speak uh, next. I'm Joe Schrager. I'm the head of our thoracic surgery group. And um, my talk it fits nicely in with Anne's because what's happening with CT screening, although as you've heard, not so much here because the screening criteria are set to include mostly people who have had a, a heavy smoking history. We actually wonder whether there are other groups who should be getting screened, but we don't know the answer to that yet. For example, um, we see more and more lung cancer in non-smokers now, so which of those people maybe would benefit from screening? We don't really know the answer to that yet. Because of the prevalence of CT scans for all kinds of reasons, we very often find lung cancer at when they're very small now. So we used to see, and we still sometimes see these, but we used to see a lot of big tumors like this, which make for very difficult surgery through big incisions, et cetera. But now, we see lots of things like this. So if you haven't looked at a CT scan, this is the front of the, this is like a slice through the body with somebody lying down, a slice through their body, and you're looking at them from their feet. So the back is down here. This is the breastbone here, the right lung, and the left lung. And so this is a smaller, sort of very early stage lung cancer that you might find on a CT scan in a patient who has no symptoms. And here's another one out over here. And here's one down here, which, if you notice, those other ones look like what we call ground glass, we call it, when they, you can sort of see through it like the glass at a swimming pool. Um, and we see a lot of cancers like that now in non-smokers. And sometimes they are sort of halfway. Some of it's ground glass and some of it's becoming solid. And these are all early stage lung cancers. Now, if we see one of these and we're not sure what it is, um, then often, as Ann said, we'll just follow them over time to see if they grow because they're very, very unlikely to spread and cause serious trouble before they've grown more than just a couple of millimeters. And we might also look to see if they're becoming more and more solid or their solidness. And if sometimes they don't grow, but they become more solid, and that means we need to do something. If we're not really sure what it is, we sometimes do a needle biopsy where here's a CAT scan and there's a tumor back here, which you don't see very well and we put a needle between the ribs and biopsy it, or sometimes we do a bronchoscopy. And now our pulmonologists have a special way of doing bronchoscopy where they can sometimes get a needle into even a very small nodule because basically the CT scan in a complicated way links up with what they're seeing on their bronchoscope view and they get guided right to the nodule and can put a needle into it. But lots of times we don't really need a preoperative diagnosis because in the right setting, one of those ground glass nodules that's becoming progressively more solid is almost always what we call an adenocarcinoma, a type of lung cancer. And what we might do in that situation, if it's far enough out in the lung, is do a, a small operation to just remove the nodule itself and then decide whether that's enough of an operation for that nodule or whether we need to do something more. So we used to do a lot of these operations through a big incision that went like this. This is somebody on their side and that's their, sca their scapula. And it used to be a big incision and we'd spread the ribs, et cetera. But that's given way now to what we call VATS, video-assisted thoracic surgery, where we make three small incisions. Very little muscle is cut. We don't have to spread the ribs, so you can imagine that hurts much less. And now some people, as I'll talk about, are also doing this, what we call robotically, where a big robot is brought in and, and, uh, and the arms of the robot go through that, those little incisions. So this is what, what VATS looks like schematically, three small incisions, and we work on the lung with long instruments. And the way it works is you have the surgeon on one side and the assistant on the other side, and they're each looking across at a video camera that's giving a view from a camera that's put into a lower incision down here. This is what a, a little lung nodule might look like through, through that view. And we can usually put a finger in, and I have a very long finger, which is very useful. And and we, we feel the nodule, and then we have a target, and then we take these stapling devices and we can cut beneath the nodule and take out a small piece of lung with the nodule in it. And then we put it in a bag so we don't leave tumor cells in the incision as we're pulling it out through the incision. And, um, and that's the way we do about 70% of our lung cancer operations now. 
that's the smallest type of operation. That would be what we would call a wedge resection that looks like this, where we just take a little tiny bit of the lung with it. And for some very small tumors, that's enough. Um, then as the tumors get progressively larger and more aggressive looking by a lot of features, the way they look on CAT scan and PET scan, we might do what's called a segmentectomy where we take about half of one lobe or a lobectomy, which is sort of the standard operation that we used to always do. And even sometimes we have to take out the whole lung for an operate for a, a tumor. I think I'll skip these because they don't project very well, but it's just showing you how we dissect out different structures. This is actually the vein that feeds the lower lobe. And then we have these stapling devices that we can divide them with. We used to do this all through big incisions where we were sewing. And you actually used to really need to know how to sew to be a surgeon. But now you really don't. And then we, we take out the specimen. Now, at Stanford, about 70% of operations are being done by video-assisted thoracic surgery. Around the country overall, it's more like 30%. Um, you know, all of our surgeons are trained specifically to do thoracic surgery, meaning not heart surgery. We all train in heart surgery and thoracic, meaning sort of lung surgery and esophageal surgery and mediastinal surgery. But at Stanford, we're sort of super specialized into just doing thoracic, so none of us do heart surgery anymore. Um, now, of course, we wouldn't consider doing that unless the cure rate was equivalent. And for stage one lung cancer, the cure rate is the same as with the big incision and kind of doing it the old fashioned way. It's not really entirely clear for stage two and three. And some people are pushing the envelope to try to do it with a minimally invasive incisions. And some people uh, feel that the thoracotomy is still necessary for those more advanced cases. The advantages are obviously it hurts less. You get back to what you need to do uh, in your life sooner. There are less complications because it's easier for you to cough after surgery, so you're less likely to get a pneumonia. And it facilitates, if you need chemotherapy, it facilitates getting the chemotherapy sooner and getting the full dose of chemotherapy because many people who used to have a thoracotomy would never, they would just be too kind of ill to get their chemotherapy within eight weeks of surgery. So the two problems with vasculobectomy are basically one is it can be dangerous because obviously you're through small incisions, so if you get into bleeding from one of those big vessels or something, it can be difficult. So you wanna make sure your surgeon has a lot of experience. Um, and the other thing is when I talk about a VATS lobectomy, it means we're removing the entire lobe, but we've gradually moved towards taking out less and less lung, sort of like with breast cancer. 50 years ago, everybody had a full mastectomy for breast cancer, and now it's all lumpectomy and radiation. So we've moved a little bit in that direction uh, first, I'll just mention robotic lobectomy. Two of my partners are doing robotic lobectomy. I'm doing only VATS. And if in here is a patient under all of this machinery, and each of these arms is an, is an arm of a robot that goes through one of those little incisions, and it's controlled by a surgeon who sits at the side of the table at a console. The, so you could say, well, that's, that's very impressive, but what's the advantage? So there are probably some disadvantages and some advantages. I think I just hit something by accident here. Should I re-hit that button? The right, lower right button? There we go. That must be what happened the last time. Um, so often there are more incisions with the robot rather than less. Just it's complicated to explain, but you need more incisions. So it actually may hurt a little bit more. But the potential advantages are that you get 3D vision. The, robe, the camera for the robot is set up to be three-dimensional. When we do VATS, we have to sort of you get used to seeing things in two dimensions and finding your way to things two-dimensionally, but the robot gives us 3D. And also, the, there are wrists, just like a human wrist at the end of each robotic arm. So whereas when we do VATS, we have sort of straight sticks that we have to work with, so we have some limitations in small spaces. With the robot, we have full moving arms that we control with our fingers sitting at that side table. So um, some people think you might get a more precise lymph node removal because of that. But the disadvantages are, one, the surgeon isn't sitting there right at the bedside. So if the, again, if there's a problem, you have to get the robot out of the way and get, get there quickly. Um, and that can be problematic. And you don't have any tactile feedback. You have, you're working through these metal arms, so you can't feel if there are any engineers in the room. You can't feel what's going on at the tips. And so at least early in the experience, it seems like some people have more trouble causing injury to normal structures and things. So it's something that's, that's on its way, but maybe not quite here yet. Time will tell. Um, 
Going back to the issue of doing less than taking out a full lobe. So as I said, there are all these degrees of lung we can take out. And we used to think that lobectomy was the only thing to do. But a little tumor like this, which is half, that's what we call ground glass, and half solid, has a much, uh, easy, is much easier to cure than a pure solid tumor like this one here. So if I saw this tumor, I would probably do a full lobectomy because it allows me to get out all the lymph nodes that drain that area into this part of the chest. If I just were to do a, what we call a wedge excision of that, I wouldn't get all those lymph nodes. That would be fine with this, with this tumor, but it wouldn't be good with this one. So we look at all sorts of different factors looking at these tumors to decide what to do. And this is just some data which shows that one of those solid looking tumors that doesn't have ground glass in it, even though you don't see lymph nodes on a CAT scan, even if it's less than three centimeters in size, about 18% of the patients will have spread to lymph nodes. And so you have to do a lobectomy to get all that stuff out. So there have been lots of studies trying to decide whether we can do less than a lobectomy for some of these smaller tumors. And to make a long story short, the answer is pretty clearly yes. We don't know yet for solid tumors that are really small if we can do that. There's a big study going on all around the country now to try to figure that out. And then there's an operation called segmentectomy, which is kind of halfway between a lobectomy and a wedge resection, which seems to be a little better than a wedge resection, you know, a little more reliable for a slightly bigger tumor. And we're trying to sort out which of these are really right for which tumor. The safest thing when you're not sure is to do a lobectomy, so we still do a lot of lobectomies. So our approach, if you've got an appropriately located in the lung less than two centimeter tumor that's just ground glass, you could argue you might not even have to do anything about it, but if we really think it's something that's on its way to becoming a real lung cancer, an invasive lung cancer, we would do a wedge resection of that, and we would sample lymph nodes, and as long as there's no cancer in the lymph nodes, we would ask the pathologist to look at it right away during the surgery. And if there's no cancer in the lymph nodes, we would just leave it at that. If it's got more than a tiny bit of solidness, though, in a, in a small tumor, we would try to do a segmentectomy, as long as the lymph nodes are negative, we would leave it at a segmentectomy. But if the lymph nodes are positive, we would do a lobectomy. And anything bigger than that, we would do, we would do a lobectomy. So we're seeing lots more of these small nodules, which is a great thing because we're curing most of these patients. I mean, the cure rates for these small tumors are sometimes as high as 90%. Um, many of them, as I said, are non-solid or part solid or you know, what we call ground glass. They, they are less aggressive, so we do less aggressive surgery. VATS and robotic surgery is perfect for, the, for these sites of tumors. I'm sure Bill will, will tell us that radiation is sometimes good for some of these tumors also. And, um, and we have a very high rate of cure with these tumors. So this is one of the ways that lung cancer, you know, the, the old mortality rate you'd hear if you get lung cancer, it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, limited chance of cure. And that's really changed a lot because of these things you've heard in the last couple of talks. Thank you. So the next speaker is Bill Liu, who is the head of our thoracic radiation oncology. So he uses x-rays to do the things I use uh, scissors for. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to switch over uh, and talk a little bit about advances in radiation therapy for lung cancer. Uh, so uh, I uh, lead the uh, lung cancer radiation therapy program at Stanford. Um, and uh, this is a, a good way to follow up on uh, the, uh, what you just heard from Dr. Leung and Dr. Schrager. Uh, so I'm just going to go backtrack a little bit and go over uh, some of the basics. So you heard from Dr. Le Leung's uh, talk earlier about some of the statistics related to lung cancer. I'm going to briefly talk about stages of lung cancer because this is, what, uh, this is one of the main factors that guides the, the, the treatment strategy for lung cancer. And we group the stages into a few different categories. So the first would be early stage, or what we refer to as localized lung cancer. Uh, and historically, um, and it's still the case that the most standard treatment, uh, the main treatment modality in this situation is surgery. Uh, but that may be combined in certain cases with chemotherapy, uh, in some cases with radiation. And there's going to be a crossover between these different categories, but uh, these are kind of the, the rules of thumb. The next most advanced stage uh, is where it, uh, we call it regional or locally advanced. In this case, the cancer is not confined just to the place in the lung where it started. It's spread to lymph nodes in the region. 
Uh, so it's still confined to the chest. There's still the potential for cure, uh, although there's also a much higher risk that the cancer spreads further. Uh, and um, <coughs> uh, the, historically, the main uh, treatment modality in this situation is radiation therapy. Again, there's crossover. Sometimes we use surgery. Most often we use chemotherapy as well. Uh, and it's still with the intent of trying to cure the cancer in the majority of cases. And then finally, we have advanced cancer or distant. This is where the cancer has spread beyond the chest to other organs in the body. Uh, and uh, we think of this as getting there. The only way that happens is when the cancer cells are spreading through the bloodstream. Uh, historically, uh, the main treatment uh, you know, mode for advanced lung cancer would be some form of drug therapy, chemotherapy, and other new uh, treatments that um, have recently come uh, online that Dr. Wakeley will be talking about next. <clears throat> uh, and historically, in this situation, we don't normally think of these as being curable cancers, but that's also changing. Um, uh, in, uh, in certain situations. So if you look at the numbers here that I put at the bottom, it's a, the text is a little bit small. Uh, one of the uh, things that you see is that, uh, as you'd expect, in the earlier stages, there's a much higher chance of curing the cancer, of patients surviving uh, you know, long term, and the benchmark that we use is five years here. Uh, and of course, that number goes down uh, lower and lower as the stage becomes more advanced. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that currently uh, the most common stage at diagnosis is the advanced stage. The majority of patients uh, are diagnosed when they already have advanced or distant uh, disease. Uh, and uh, as uh, you heard from Dr. Leung earlier, we're hoping that that's going to change as uh, new early um, detection strategies for lung cancer come into play. We really want to shift that stage at diagnosis to those earlier stages where uh, there's a higher potential for cure. Okay, so these are the classical stages that we think about, but there are some new concepts as well, uh, and uh, particularly in the metastatic or distant uh, uh, disease setting here, uh, some patients, although the cancer has spread to other parts of the body, uh, it's only in a limited amount, uh, and uh, the term that we use for that now is oligometastatic. Um, meaning oligo meaning few, and so that maybe the cancer has spread, but only to one place uh, or maybe just a few. And these patients, their prognosis may be different uh, than the more common situation where we see it more widely spread, okay? Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but uh, some of these patients actually have the potential for cure, and we don't want to overlook that possibility. Uh, another emerging concept is uh, one where, uh, so typically when the disease is advanced, it's metastatic, we start treatment with some form of drug therapy uh, and the tumors respond. Uh, and, uh, and But many times, or the general situation is that eventually the, the cancer starts to grow again. Uh, often it grows again in um, multiple places, but in certain situations it may grow back in just a few or even one place uh, that starts growing again. And so uh, when the cancer comes back, we call that progression of cancer, but certain patients may have oligo progression. So oligo again meaning few. Uh, and again, uh, this may be a situation where we want to think beyond the standard um, algorithm for treatment. Okay. So let's come back for a moment to early stage lung cancer. Um, this has been the domain of surgery, and so surgery is the standard treatment. But what we recognize is that many patients are poor candidates for surgery because uh, many patients with lung cancer uh, maybe ha have more advanced age, have more medical problems, possibly related to smoking, lung disease, heart disease, and so on. And they may not be able to tolerate uh, surgery, although, as you've heard, surgery is becoming less invasive uh, may be applicable to more patients. Um, but uh, historically, there have been very few good alternatives to surgery. Uh, and uh, that's one reason why uh, you know, we might actually push to operate uh, even on patients who you know, sort of are borderline uh, being able to tolerate it because there really were not good alternatives. Well, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, a new treatment strategy has emerged primarily for those patients who are not uh, good candidates for surgery 
Uh, it's a form of very focused radiation therapy that we refer to as SABR, and that has in fact become the new standard of care for those patients who need alternatives to surgery, and I'll, I'll get into that uh, now. So what is SABR? Uh, it's an abbreviation for stereotactic ablative radiotherapy. It's also called uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT. Uh, and uh, this uh, cartoon here illustrates uh, the, the change in technology that's happened. So in the past, if we wanted to treat a small tumor in the lung like this, we would aim a radiation beam from the front and from the back. Uh, and uh, so the radiation beams would hit the tumor, but you can see that the radiation also uh, hits a lot of the normal organs uh, in the body. And you can see that the highest doses of radiation uh, might not even be in the tumor. It might be out in the normal organs. Whereas uh, with the new uh, techniques where we use lots of radiation beams all focused on the tumor, now the highest dose of the radiation is concentrated right where the tumor is. It's not, uh, the rest of the body gets a much lower dose. So by this high focusing of radiation, that enables a couple of things. It allows us now to deliver an ablative dose to the tumor, enough to kill the tumor. Uh, so again, if the highest doses are out in the rest of the body, you can't give an ablative dose. But if the dose is right on the tumor, you can. And the other thing that it allows is it allows compressing what normally would be weeks of radiation treatment, spread out daily treatments over a few weeks, into a few days or even into a single session, again, because the highest dose is in the tumor rather than in the surrounding organs. Uh, that's correct. So we're here when you hear radio, that's referring to radiation, meaning uh, high energy x-ray therapy. Uh, thank you for that uh, question to clarify. So uh, th there's a lot of t uh, machines or technologies that can be used to deliver SABR uh, or uh, other forms of focused radiation. Uh, here are a couple that we use at Stanford um, uh, and some of which uh, we pioneered at Stanford. And just to give you a sense of how it looks technically, uh, if this is a, a tumor over here, uh, a lung tumor, and kind of a surrounding zone around it that we want to treat to make sure that we get uh, cells that, uh, uh, that may be in the vicinity. Uh, from the standpoint of this radiation treatment machine, if we're looking at the tumor, uh, we're now spinning around the tumor, and we're shaping the radiation beams from all these different directions using computer-based planning. And what that allows us to do is really sculpt the radiation dose. Um, so if you look in the color here, you can see that the high dose of radiation is sculpted to conform to a shape uh, that can be almost any shape that uh, we need it to be. Uh, and then as the dose spills out, so there's a surrounding area that gets lower dose of radiation, we can shape that too and make it bend around organs that we want to avoid uh, damaging. In this case, you can see it's bending around the spinal cord to avoid that. Okay. Uh, and as we get very precise with the focused radiation, uh, it's uh, important to uh, make sure that we get the radiation exactly where we want it to go, and then we deal with the fact that we're always treating moving targets, uh, particularly in the lung where the tumors move as we br uh, breathe. Uh, and so there are multiple strategies, uh, technologies that we've implemented over time uh, to ensure that uh, we deal with this uh, motion issue. Uh, we call it motion management. Uh, and all of these are techniques that we use in the clinic now. We can make sure that the radiation beam is shaped to conform to the path of the tumor, or we can turn on the beam only at a certain portion of the breathing cycle when the tumor is in a known location, or we can even follow the tumor around with the radiation beam. So all of those are strategies that we use. Uh, and then this is uh, what uh, an example of this type of treatment looks like. We have the treatment machine, in this case, rotating around the patient, delivering radiation beams from all these different angles. You can see it starting and stopping in coordination with the patient's breathing. So it's using that gating strategy that I showed earlier um, as one of those ways of dealing with the motion. Okay. So how about the outcomes in early stage lung cancer? Uh, again, uh, so there are many studies now. I'm just showing uh, these d data from one particular study, although uh, the results are actually very consistent across different studies. Um, so this is a study of patients with early stage lung cancer treated with SABR. Uh, these patients were not able to tolerate surgery, had other health problems. Uh, and you see that this is the, uh, the likelihood of survival over time. Uh, and what we see is that in patients who have lots of medical problems, 60% uh, of them survive for three years, which is actually very good um, and much better than uh, historical results in patients who could not receive surgery uh, for lung cancer. And uh, if you look at the control of the tumor itself, how likely are we to 
kill that tumor, uh, it's in the range of nearly 90%. Um, and interestingly, as you look at populations of patients who maybe could have had surgery, uh, but uh, for various reasons didn't, we see that uh, the tumor control, again, is very high in that close to 90% range. Uh, but now the survival is much higher because these are healthier patients. Uh, so uh, what we're seeing is that over time, uh, you know, a, a larger proportion of patients uh, were kind of offering uh, treatment options for them that they wouldn't otherwise have had. Uh, and that also means that we are better able to select, uh, you know, which patients are the best fit for surgery and should have the more invasive treatment and which are the more borderline ones that we don't have to necessarily do such invasive treatment. Okay, uh, this is just an example of what some of the treatment responses look like. Uh, this is an example from a trial that we're doing at Stanford right now where we're choosing the dose and the scheduling of the radiation based on the size and location of the tumor. So here you see two tumors in two different patients, a bigger one and a smaller one, each of which has been individually dosed uh, with Sabre. And you can see that uh, after treatment three years later, both of those tumors are gone. Um, uh, with a little bit of scar tissue left behind. <coughs> okay, so uh, the locally advanced lung cancer, I'm just going to touch on briefly. This is the domain where historically the most standard treatment has been radiation therapy uh, together with chemotherapy. Uh, again, some of these patients' uh, surgery may be beneficial, uh, and uh, now a new, uh, very new results indicate that immunotherapy following chemo and radiation is a new standard of care. Uh, Dr. Wakeley may be touching on that. Um, but uh, where the advances come as far as radiation is concerned is that our ability to focus the radiation better in this situation uh, has also led to improvements mainly in dramatically reduced side effects. So we're able to get patients more reliably through treatment um, and complete all of their treatment. And a point that I think is worth making here is that <coughs> our drug therapies, as you'll hear soon, uh, have been getting better and better. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think one of the things that uh, has emerged is that as the drug therapies get better, that actually increases the potential of local therapies, such as surgery and radiation, uh, to improve cure rates in these cancers. So the, the better drugs are not doing it all by themselves, uh, but combined with uh, these other treatments, uh, our outcomes in all of these categories is getting better. Uh, and then finally, in the uh, advanced lung cancer setting, uh, and I'm going to focus on those sort of special scenarios of the oligometastatic and oligoprogressive. So here's where the standard therapy uh, has been uh, systemic drugs that go everywhere throughout the body. Uh, there's the classical chemotherapy, but as you'll hear, uh, newer treatments that are mutation-targeted oral drugs and then immunotherapy. Um, uh, but uh, we're able to use this focused sort of radiation to allow safe ablation of, uh, of uh, certain tumors. And uh, so, for example, in that situation where there's just one or a few metastases that have spread, uh, we can now use focused radiation, and in some cases surgery as well, to ablate those tumors. Uh, and some of those patients, even though they have metastatic disease, uh, can live longer and some can be cured. And so. Uh, here are a couple of uh, recent randomized trials. They're small trials, but showing the potential of that concept, where um, they were randomized between continuing on the chemotherapy that they were having if they only had a small number of metastases, or ablating those small number of metastases with radiation therapy or surgery. Uh, and what these lines show uh, is that those patients who had the local ablation of tumors actually uh, survive longer without uh, c uh, progression of their cancer uh, compared to just continuing on chemotherapy alone. Um, and they also developed fewer new tumors. Uh, and then in those situations, even where patients have more widespread uh, cancer, but it may be responding to therapy, drug therapy, um, the normal thing to do when the cancer starts progressing again would be to switch to the next line of therapy, new drugs, uh, because the uh, presumption is that the current drugs are no longer working. But if the progression is only in one spot or a couple, uh, some of those patients uh, may benefit from ablating those tumors uh, that have become resistant to the current drug, and they can continue to benefit from the drug they were on. Uh, and, uh, and so we kind of get more mileage from each line of drug therapy. Uh, so this is just one example of a trial that we're doing at Stanford now based on the immunotherapy concept 
uh, where patients with oligometastatic disease or oligoprogressive disease uh, will get radiation therapy to um, a number of tumors in order to see if we can increase the benefit of that uh, immunotherapy that they're on. Uh, so uh, this is just an anecdote, but one that illustrates kind of these concepts put together. This is a patient who had a locally advanced lung cancer at diagnosis involving the left lung. This is a PET scan uh, and lymph nodes uh, so th uh, that would normally get chemo and radiation. Uh, but when we were planning the radiation therapy to start with the chemo, we found that actually already the cancer had spread to the adrenal gland. Uh, so now it's actually an advanced stage four lung cancer. Uh, well, we took an aggressive and, you know, uh, at the time, not really standard approach with this patient. We treated it all aggressively with chemo and radiation. We did SABR for the one oligometastatic adrenal uh, tumor. Uh, and six years later, uh, no recurrence of the cancer. This patient was cured of stage four lung cancer. And to follow that up, three years later, he came back to me with a newly diagnosed stage one lung cancer in the other lung. Uh, and uh, was uh, not a candidate for surgery at that time. So a year ago, we treated that with Sabre, so that bringing back to that early stage lung cancer, uh, and uh, he remains without evidence of cancer, uh, surviving two, ca two lung cancers. So, um, and then finally, just to give a kind of a glimpse of a future direction of something that we're working on at Stanford, uh, here I'm showing again that earlier picture of the um, radiation machine rotating around and de delivering the radiation beams. Uh, this is actually played back in kind of real time. Uh, so this is actually something, a technique that we implemented at Stanford that is uh, the, currently the fastest delivery of radiation therapy in the world. Uh, this is a high dose of radiation that takes about three minutes to deliver. Um, and so that's dramatically faster than we've been able to do in the past. Uh, but uh, despite that, Three minutes is still quite a long time for the body to move around. There's a lot of breathing motion and so on. And so we want to push the technology forward to this new concept um, that uh, uh, is kind of the main research area I'm working on together with uh, collaborators at SLAC National Accelerator Lab. Uh, and using next generation linear accelerator technology, the idea here is to get the entire treatment done in under a second, fast enough to freeze all of the motion uh, to get the most precise uh, radiation therapy. And what we're starting to discover in the lab is that there, when you deliver the radiation that rapidly, there's some interesting biological effects too. That uh, surprisingly, the damage to the normal organs, dose for dose, is less than the conventional speed of radiation delivery, uh, but the tumor control is as good or better. Uh, so if that, uh, that's, that's working out in mice so far, we think. Um, if that uh, translates to humans, uh, it could be a totally new ball game uh, for cancer therapy. Um, so, just to uh, kind of uh, uh, look over a little bit of um, the radiation therapy history at Stanford, it turns out that uh, a little over 60 years ago, uh, the first medical linear accelerator in the Western Hemisphere was invented here at Stanford uh, and changed the standard of care for radiation therapy. A little over 20 years ago, uh, the first uh, robotic radiosurgery system was invented here at Stanford, we call it the CyberKnife. Um, and these are popular treatment systems that have uh, uh, disseminated around the world. And hopefully in a few years, we'll have uh, the next generation of treatment uh, with phaser. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so that was the high tech talk. I'm the low tech talk, OK? So I'm just going um, to speak with all of you without slides, because I know there's been a lot of information tonight. And we want this to be very much an interactive session. So I'm going to talk through a few topics. And then all four of us are going to come up. Um, and we'll have about a half an hour, or maybe even a little bit more, depending on how much I talk now, uh, to go through any questions that you might have. Um, lung cancer is obviously a very broad topic. And um, it hits people at, at different stages, or maybe not them, but family members, people they know. and so. It, there are a lot of different ways that you all are probably looking at this information. Some of you might be thinking about it just from the standpoint of, well, I have metastatic cancer or someone I know does. And most of what we've been talking about today are the advances in curing. And so I'm going to be talking a lot more about the advances that we have in people with metastatic disease, hopefully leading towards cures as well. 
And one thing I wanted to highlight, many of you probably know this, but the reason that we're doing this today in November is that November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. How many of you knew that? Okay, so not very many. So you've learned at least one thing tonight. Uh, November's Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And it's interesting because um, if you ask a lot of people, they know that Breast Cancer Awareness Month is in October um, because there's pink everywhere and people are talking about it. And lung cancer still doesn't get as much attention. Um, so that's why even those of you who came to a lung cancer talk didn't know it was Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Um, lung cancer awareness is also... Um, our ribbon, our color is clear, which makes it a little harder to get everybody kind of wearing that, right? Um, but it's the idea that lung cancer remains a bit of an invisible disease. Um, it's also, I mean, there's air in the lungs, so that's obvious, but it's a bit of an invisible disease because there's been a lot of a stigma around it. And that stigma comes from the fact that a lot of people who do get lung cancer have a history of smoking. And for that reason, a lot of politicians and other fundraisers were kind of afraid to talk about it. Um, and we realized that uh, nobody deserves to get lung cancer, and lung cancer doesn't just happen to people who have had a history of smoking, it can happen to anybody. Um, and so there's been a lot of emphasis on trying to move away from that stigma so that we can get people more aware of it, realize that lung cancer, unfortunately, is still the leading cause of cancer death in this country, but it's very much underfunded. And so we're trying to you know, make sure that people are aware of that so we can continue with the advances that you've already heard a lot about today from my colleagues and then I'm going to talk about. And the good news is there's a lot of really exciting things happening in lung cancer research. Um, and so that's why we're able to give these exciting talks now and why we're able to help, more importantly, help a lot more people. So you've heard today about what we're doing to better find lung cancer early from Dr. Leung. You've heard about the fabulous things that we're able to do when we find cancer when it's localized, either from surgery, with some amazing new technology, from radiation oncology. But we still have to deal with the fact that lung cancer for almost everybody is still a disease that gets rather, it kind of gets into the bloodstream. It's a rather systemic disease. We used to think if we found it when it was really small, we could remove it and that was the end of it. And that's still true. But what we didn't understand then that we do now is that even from the earliest stages, cancer is actually getting out into the body. It's just that our immune system is usually able to take care of any residual cells if you do the surgery or the radiation and when it's found early enough. And that's because those cancer cells that escape early, they haven't really figured out how to grow in other places. But once this cancer has grown a little bit bigger or has spread anywhere, lymph nodes or other places, we know that the treatments that we give need to be treatments that can get throughout the whole body. And so that's where, as a medical oncologist, I play a role. Um, it also leads to some questions about diagnosis. And that was a specific question we had before we started that I'll talk a little bit about. So the imaging pictures that Anne talked about is really one of the, that's the oldest way that we know to look at lung cancer. It's a rapidly evolving with new techniques and it's really, really important way of finding lung cancer and in helping us know if we're helping people. You know, I can't look at someone and know always what's happening with their cancer, but if I get um, a scan, then Dr. Leung and her colleagues can help me know what's going on inside the body. But we also know that there are other ways to start monitoring that now, and that is by looking at the bloodstream and, and taking blood from patients, not just to look for what's happening and how their liver is working or their white blood cell counts, but we can actually find evidence of the cancer now in the bloodstream. And I can think back to 10 years ago, we started really talking about this idea. And at that time, we were trying really hard to be able to draw blood and find the tumor cells in the blood. And we can do that sometimes, it's tricky. But what we've realized is that finding the cells isn't so important as finding the evidence that the cancer's there, and that's in tumor DNA. Um, and so you, you all know in the cell there's the DNA, and cancer, what makes it to cancer as opposed to the normal tissue is that there's been a change somewhere in the DNA. So a single mutation sometimes, lots of mutations other times, but something has made the tumor cell different than all the other cells in the body, and that's what makes the cancer unique. And so what happens in all of our cells as cells are dying, DNA from the center of the cell is released, and you can find it in the blood if you look quickly, because it doesn't stay long. But with the tumor, when it's shedding its DNA, some of that DNA is the tumor-specific DNA. And so if you can find it, you get a sense of what's happening 
in, with the cancer without even having to do the scans. No offense to Dr. Leong, scans are so important, but it gives us a different way of looking. And so we can now, and this is technology that's been developed at Stanford by a couple of our colleagues, Ashley Zaday and Max Dean, as well as at a lot of other places. This is a really exciting new area. But we can draw the blood, and we can look to see if there's a signature that looks like a tumor signature. If we already know from the, the actual tumor biopsy what the DNA is, that's abnormal looks like, it's really, it's much easier to find. But even when we don't, we can now start doing that, where we can draw the blood, and then we can look and find, are there specific gene mutations that are going on that we think would be tumor specific? And if we find them, then we know a lot more about the tumor and, and actually can figure out some treatments from it. So that's really exciting. So this is the liquid biopsies, and it's talked about a lot now, um, with the liquid usually being blood, but there are also liquid biopsies looking at urine. Which can, the DNA can be shed there. Sputum, spitting it up. So this is a very rapidly evolving area. And how that technology is important is it can help first with once you have a diagnosis and you know someone has cancer, maybe you didn't get enough tissue when you did a biopsy. So instead of having to do another biopsy, we can now do these blood tests and we can figure out what genes are, have the mutations in the tumor. And that can help guide treatment. That's really important. Or when someone's been on a treatment and it stops working, we can figure out why. We can figure out what else changed. What other mutations did that tumor figure out to escape the treatment that we're giving? And that can help us know which the next treatment. It also probably is going to be able to help us know for people who have had surgery or have had radiation who hopefully are cured, it's going to help us know earlier who's probably not cured. And so this was a very recent publication where we were able to show that for people who had had surgery or most of them had had radiation, we could look for evidence of the tumor DNA in a short window, just a few months after the surgery or radiation, and if we found that evidence, that person was at much higher risk of having the cancer come back. And if we didn't, then we knew that person was going to be cured and they probably didn't need any additional treatment. So this is where that technology is very quickly going. And we can envision a day in the near future, not quite yet, where instead of having to necessarily get CT scans, which are still important, um, we maybe can, with the blood draws, have a better sense of, is someone at risk of getting cancer? Is there cancer somewhere that we haven't seen yet? So this is where that's all evolving. So that's a really big area. And I'm, you know, I'm a medical oncologist. I, I help people who are living with their cancer and offer treatments. But we're also working closely with our collaborators in better ways to diagnose and follow. All right, so why does all that matter? Well, some of it's obvious. But as far as understanding the tumor, when I see a patient who has metastatic lung cancer and we're trying to figure out how do we best help them, we have three kind of major topics of treatment categories. One is chemotherapy. And I can tell you that when almost everybody comes in, I, I get the not chemotherapy because there's this general fear of chemotherapy. And it's actually not that bad for most people. There are absolutely people who have a hard time with it, but many people do quite well with chemotherapy. And it's still a really important tool that we have and almost everybody needs chemotherapy at some point. Not everybody loses their hair with chemotherapy. Not everybody feels terrible and is vomiting. You know, a lot of people actually feel quite well and are able to be working and active, especially if they had a lot of symptoms to begin with. So chemo is not a bad thing. So I, was, I usually start talking that way because otherwise I get the no chemo, right? So, and that's been around a while. Where things have really changed, about a decade ago, we started to understand more about those gene changes I was talking about, where were there specific genes that are commonly the ones that cause the lung cancer. So one is called EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor. And that was the first one we discovered. And we discovered it because we knew that that EGFR protein was important in lung function and that levels were really high in a lot of lung cancers. But it wasn't something that was serving a purpose a lot of other places except the skin. And so the idea was, well, if we could target that, we maybe would impact lung cancer. And so d drugs were developed. They're all pill drugs, actually. And they worked really well for about 10% of people. I was like, well, wh what's different about that 10%? And there were observations about how they tended to be people who got lung cancer who had never smoked, but not always. They were often women, but not always. Um, many of them were of Asian ethnicity, but not always. But this led to some studies that were done where people who fit those categories either got these pill drugs for EGFR or chemo. 
And when the results came out, it was a little confusing. We didn't know what to make of it, except in that same period of time, people went back and did more work on the patients who had done really well and looked at their tumors, and they realized that many of those tumors, all of them actually, had a change in the EGFR gene. That EGFR gene was mutated. It turned on that protein all the time, and that's what was the cause of the cancer. We don't know why it happened. We still don't, but we know that that was the change, that genetic change that led to the cancer. And so when they went back and looked at this trial where the people who were never smokers and it was all done in Asia who had lung cancer, they realized that the group that had that mutation, they did much better starting on one of these EGFR drugs as opposed to chemo. And so that's how we started to realize, oh, if we know more about the tumor, we can pick the best treatment. Because the people that didn't have the mutation really didn't do well with that EGFR drug. So now we know we have to look for EGFR and as someone who's diagnosed with metastatic cancer, and if we find it, we know that we, we should start with one of these EGFR pills. And that's, that's great, except they don't always work for a really long time. For some people, they work for years, and that's always fabulous. For some people, they work for less time. And in the past, when this started, we knew we could treat with one type of drug, and then it stopped working. So then we figured out why. For most people, there's a new mutation that happens, and then the original set of drugs that we had, they didn't work anymore. So we developed the next set of drugs that work when that other mutation happens. Um, and so that gave people another, the next step before they had to go on to get chemotherapy or other treatments. So that's been really exciting. And then just a month ago, we realized that if we start with this next class of drugs, what we call the third generation drug, at the very beginning, for many people, that works longer. So we now have options. For some people, those first set of EGFR drugs are great. And anybody who's on them and doing well with them, we keep going. But when someone gets diagnosed today, I talk about these, these new results and about this pill drug, the newer one, where we can probably will get to it for most people, but now we think about starting with it. And it's constantly evolving, because now we have to figure out, well, when this new drug stops working, why does it stop working? What do we do for it? So that's where a lot of the research is now, and whether or not we can add things to it. So that's the EGFR story. But we also have to look for ALK and ROS and BRAF and RED, and the list keeps getting longer all the time is we realize that lung cancers aren't all the same. They're actually different mutations that cause many of them. And if we figure out what the mutation is, we can kind of go down a different path for treatment. So that's great. Um, but that's not everybody. Some people don't just have a single mutation that's a problem in their tumor. They have a lot of different things going on. And so in that case, then we have immune therapy. And so the immune therapy is based on this idea that, as, as we talked about, when the cancers are really small, we know from the very beginning they're spreading throughout the body, right? But our immune system's able to find and attack and kill it before it starts to grow in other places. But as the tumor gets bigger, it figures out how to grow. So we have been, we, that's the royal we, I wasn't in the lab, but many people have figured out that when the cancer is evading the immune system, there's some specific tricks it uses. And one of them is it uses a protein called PDL1. Many of you have probably heard that, right? PDL1. And what it does, PDL1 is, is a, it's a protein that we all have in our bodies. It's a normal protein. And it's used by many of our normal tissues to, to say to the immune system, this is, I'm normal, leave me alone. Um, and so it, you know, it's, it's sort of on the surface. And if an immune cell comes in to attack, it sees this PDL1 protein, it's like, oh, that's normal tissue, I'm gonna back off. But with cancer, some of the cancers use that same signal, so they put a lot of PDL1 protein. So when the immune system comes into attack, they see that and like, oh, normal, go away. So what was done was drugs were developed that block that protein. Say, so, okay, we're gonna mask it. So they, they inhibit the PD1 or PDL1 protein. So then when the immune system comes in, it doesn't see the protein anymore says, oh, that doesn't look normal, and it attacks the cancer, right? So that's what we want to have happen. It took a long time to develop this concept. I remember actually in medical school, which I won't tell you when it was, but it was not recently. Um, in medical school, we were kind of discussing this pd one protein, and, and well, what if we could block that somehow? Would that help us have better attack? And it took a long time, but many people worked very hard, and they were able to come up with drugs that can block pd one And when that was done, so for some people, the immune system attacks the cancer very, very well. Not everybody, though. So it's not, it's not a perfect drug, and it's a class of drugs. There's several of them that are approved, but it's a whole new class of options for treatment. And so what we do now is we look for those gene mutations we talked about, and then we look to see if there's pdl one protein on the tumor. 
because it's the tumors that have that high PD-L1 protein, usually, nothing's ever perfect, but usually that are most sensitive to these drugs. And so when we find the high PD-L1 and we give the drugs, then the immune drugs can help them, well, they help the immune system attack the cancer better. They're, they're not curing yet. You know, we haven't quite gotten to that point, but they're helping for many people shrink the tumors and keep it controlled. Just like with the pill drugs, we can control the cancer for a long period of time or chemotherapy to help people with what we're trying to do, which is get everyone keeping living their lives and feeling okay with the cancer relatively well controlled. So with the immune drugs, when they work, they can work and we can give them before chemo for some people, about a third of people. Um, and when they stop working, that's again another big area of research is, well, when it stops working, what did the immune system lose? What did the cancer figure out to do to make the immune system not recognize it anymore? So those are sort of the big categories of research right now is working more on these immune systems, getting them to work better with these targeted drugs, trying to figure out, well, what's the next one and the next one and the next one? And then how do you interact immune and targeted together? Because that's been tricky. And where does chemo fit into all of this? And then how do you take all of that and move it into people who have earlier stages of disease to improve cure rates there. So those are the kind of things that we are working on. So that's what I wanted to talk about. And then we've got time for questions. Thanks. Uh, Is there a question in the back? That's a, a great question. Um, it's a little tricky to answer the first one because um, our cancer registries actually do not collect smoking data, believe it or not. And so you can't look at it clearly from the whole population and, and get a sense. We know that um, from data in California, for women with lung cancer, about uh, 70 to 80% have a history of smoking and for men it's still 80 to 90%. Um, that is, in this particular Bay Area, the numbers are, are, are a little bit different than that, but we still, it's hard to put specifics on it. Um, in parts of Asia, there are areas where for a woman who gets lung cancer, only 40% of any history of smoking. So it's somewhere in that range. Your question about what are we doing to screen for it is a good one. Um, Anne will probably talk about the, the CT imaging. Um, with the new blood tests that are being developed, probably things are gonna shift so that that will be part of sort of annual screening for people in the future. But for right now, they're not sensitive enough and you have to always keep in mind that when you're developing a screening test, you wanna make sure you find everybody that has the disease, but you don't wanna give a false positive result to anybody. And that's still the challenge that we have because the false positives can lead to obviously a lot of anxiety, unnecessary tests and even potential harm when you're doing the diagnostic imaging or diagnostic anything that you're doing procedures. I, so, I can add, uh, if, if you look at most academic medical centers in the country, about 90% of the surgical patients for, with lung cancer are, have a history of smoking. Um, here we have 35% um, of our patients are non-smokers. So it's 35% versus 10%. So Heather was talking about um, the, the rates of smoking versus non-smoking related cancers in parts of Asia. And unfortunately, um, Asians are a predisposed group who develop cancers um, without antecedent smoking. And so for example, in a place like Taiwan, right now 50% uh, or more of their lung cancers that are being diagnosed are being diagnosed in non-smokers. So this is a big health issue for them. And um, they are starting to look at you know, contributors to why their population is predisposed to lung cancers. And so they're looking obviously at things like genetics, pollution, um, et cetera. I, I would say that, that in this country currently we do not have set eligibility criteria for non-smokers. But having said that, places uh, like Taiwan, what they're doing is they're looking very strongly at genetic factors like family history. So in folks who have a family history, a strong family history of lung cancer in non-smokers, they are screening these individuals. 
So using and we, CT. Actually, yeah, one of our uh, the questions that was written down was about that that family history. I don't know if you want to comment more on that because it, it, my understanding is that um, it tends to be if there's family histories of people who are younger, um, that that's particularly where there's a bit more risk. But if um, if the parents or other family it's members are, are significantly older or have a smoking history, then it becomes less of a Sure. A risk. I mean, the, the things that folks are looking at are exactly as you say, Heather. They're looking at primary degree relatives who develop cancer at a relatively young age and who are non-smokers. I'm going to um, go through some of our many questions. Um, so I'm going to take this first one, which is, do any of these approaches work on tumors in the brain? And so all of the systemic treatments I talked about, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immune therapy, they all work very well in the brain. I don't know if you want to mention radiation. Sure. So um, uh, historically, uh, you know, one of the uh, primary treatments for tumors after, once they've spread to the brain has been radiation therapy. Um, because uh, uh, at least uh, you know, in older generations of drugs, uh, many of them are not able to penetrate what we call the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so even though you're giving chemotherapy, it goes everywhere in the body, there's certain portions of the body that are relatively exclude the drugs. Um, and so it's less reliable to, to treat them uh, once they've spread there. The other thing about brain, you know, tumors that have spread to the brain, because it's a smaller enclosed compartment, uh, there's a higher likelihood that they will eventually cause symptoms um, and potentially quite severe symptoms. Uh, one of the uh, trends in treatment of tumors that have spread to the brain, uh, brain metastases, uh, is to, you know, just like we've talked about before, rather than treating the entire brain uh, with radiation, uh, you know, which would have been a, 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 the most standard strategy in the past, we now use much more focused radiation treatments to basically spot treat where those tumors are uh, and give a higher dose uh, so that we're better able to control those specific tumors. And um, so the trend is moving towards um, chasing after these tumors with uh, focused radiation, uh, even if there are multiple ones, uh, and, uh, and reducing the use of the whole brain radiation therapy. Right. And, and one of the questions was about, is SABRE treatment only available at Stanford? Um, and the answer to that is no. There are a lot of fabulous developments, as, as Dr. Liu was talking about, but many, many, many treatment centers offer this stereotactic ablative radiation. They're just, they're different technologies, different companies doing it. Um, so it's not just Stanford. Other than X-ray, are they using uh, positrons or electron beams, proton beams? Yeah, so there are, there are a number of types of radiation therapy. The most common would be the high-energy X-ray therapy. Uh, that's in a, you know, uh, more than 95%. Um, there are certain other types of radiation, uh, and probably the one that you hear most about is proton beam therapy, uh, because uh, in certain situations with these different particles treating with protons rather than X-rays, you're able to get a little bit better shaping of the dose. Um, particularly kind of that, uh, that intermediate and low dose just kind of spilling out is more confined uh, with the proton beam. And so there's sort of situations where that uh, may have some advantages. Okay. Is that something that's common? I mean, if I go in tomorrow for a blood test, is that going to be tested as far as cancer? So the, the blood tests for cancer, the, the technology I was talking about, um, those are not yet available unless someone has a known cancer diagnosis and it's being tracked for specific mutations. Um, we're still a little bit away from that being sort of a screening test to see if people have lung cancer. Um, there are some tumor markers that are used for some other cancers, but a lot of controversy around them. And again, it gets to this idea of this that being very specific, right? You don't want to have a screening test that's sort of seeing things that aren't necessarily true um, because it sets off a whole lot of other anxiety and, and trying to find something that might not be there. So right now the blood tests, the, just to detect is there a cancer or not in someone who has no known history of it, they're not quite there. Other questions? Okay, Anne, there are so a lot of imaging questions. Um, and I think um, you know, they have to do with a lot of these questions and Joe would probably want to answer this also because of your work with the ground glass opacities. But asking a lot about, well, if someone's had a, a GGO or 
which are the ground glass opacities or a shadow or something else that's abnormal on a scan in the past that was either from a long time ago or, or went away, what are the intervals for following those? So there are a couple questions asking that same question. So um, if we're talking specifically about ground glass nodules, Heather, I would say that uh, right now, um, because a lot of the data has come from Asia, where they have been screening for a much longer period of time than in the US, we, ha we do have some guidelines in place as to when different types of abnormality should be followed and at what intervals. So, you know, you, you folks are a very, very um, educated and interested audience. For those of you who are particularly interested, there are new guidelines, the 2017 Fleischner guidelines that have come out for incidentally identified nodules. And they have a portion of those guidelines dedicated towards ground glass nodules. Now, ground glass nodules, as you heard from Dr. Schrager, some of these are totally benign. Okay, we see them, and they're never going to, they're never going to progress, they're never going to, they're never going to hurt uh, the, the individual who has them, nothing will happen, they're just a finding. Others, unfortunately, do progress. And so these guidelines have been developed with the idea that we look at, you know, different morphologic characteristics, whether they're purely ground glass, whether they're, you know, partly solid, as you were hearing from Dr. Schrager, and then we make determinations as to um, whether they need to be followed and how frequently they should be followed and for what total duration of time. So there are guidelines that are out um, for incidentally identified nodules, and those are the so-called 2017 Fleischner guidelines. Uh, that's an question yeah. that's a that's an extremely good question. So the you know, that there is a medical terminology that we use, and um, so when we look at at nodules, which are usually you know roughly circular abnormalities in the lungs that we're seeing on a CT scan, we will describe um, different characteristics. And we use these characteristics because they're helpful for determining whether something is serious or whether something is, is not serious, okay, benign or potentially cancer. And so the way that we can look at a nodule is we can say, what is the density characteristic? Is it ground glass? And you heard from Dr. Schrager, when we say ground glass, we're basically looking at, say, a glass, and if it has that... Uh, ground appearance, you, it is translucent, but you cannot see clearly through it. That's what, that is the uh, morphologic characteristic of a nodule on a CT scan. So we can see the underlying architecture through that nodule, and we call that ground glass. As contrasted to a nodule in which all the underlying architectural characteristics of the lung are obscured. We call that solid. Ground glass nodule, it's translucent, solid nodule, Everything is obscured, okay? Then you brought up another term, calcified. So calcified means that when the nodule is now very bright, it's very bright in density, it looks like bone, okay? That tells us that, that when we see that characteristic, it has the same density value as bone, then that nodule is almost always benign. So there are different, yes. So there are different, almost always, Okay, there's no 100% no in medicine. You know, in some situations, people who have bone-forming tumors, those, those nodules, unfortunately, are malignant. But, but in a patient without a prior history of a cancer like that, they are basically going to be benign. What about non-calcified? No, so non-calcified are ground glass and solid. Okay? The only thing I would add about the ground glass nodules is um, I guess Anne mentioned overdiagnosis. So the, the, one of our concerns is that a lot of these ground glass nodules, even if they are sort of pre-cancers, they won't ever progress to anything dangerous and that we could do too much with these ground glass nodules. We could give too many CAT scans, which can give radiation. We could do surgery um, on things that are not necessary. And so we have to be very careful about how kind of intensely we get worried about these ground glass nodules. 
deciding factor on a pure GGO? It's a lot of things. I mean, it, it's a lot of things. Um, you know, if I, we very rarely operate uh, or recommend aggressive treatment for somebody the first time we see a GGO that's, say, under a centimeter and a half. Um, because if it's a pure GGO, when we say solid, solid on radiography typically means invasive, and ground glass typically means non-invasive, meaning it doesn't have the potential to spread yet. It may be a, what we call an in situ cancer, which means sort of a precancer that's not invasive, and only when it gets a significant amount of solid in it does it really have a risk to spread and cause a problem. So when we, when we see a pure GGO, we don't really worry about it. If it grows some, we're convinced it's going to progressively grow. It's probably better to get it out earlier rather than later because it's easier to get out you know, when it's small and, and before it has a chance to spread. But it's not an emergency. It's, it's not doing anything quickly. As long as it doesn't have a big solid component in it, it's really not going to spread anywhere. So we just want to get it before it's got a substantial solid component. So um, getting back to these, so we've got a few more imaging questions, lots of those. Um, and one is about the low-dose CTs and whether those exist for CTs of chest, abdomen, and pelvis, or if it's just the chest. And also, for people who have a history of a cancer and that's being followed, where do the low-dose scans fit into that? So I think that, um, to, to, so the good news about imaging the lungs is that the lungs are primarily composed of air. And it's very easy to see uh, abnormalities in the lungs because there is a natural contrast agent, which is air in the lungs. We can perform low dose CTs because basically abnormalities in the lungs are naturally conspicuous. Okay. It is much more difficult to do low-dose studies of the abdomen where we're looking at organs like the liver because the natural contrast for abnormalities that involve the liver is not as high as in the lung. So I would say that for, for uh, chest CTs where we're primarily looking at the lungs and we are looking for a specific task, we're looking for nodules, we can perform low-dose CT. So every screening exam is done at low dose. And because it's got one task, which is largely to identify cancers, which are in the lung, okay? If we were looking for other things, if we were looking for, say, fluid in the pleural space, if we were looking for abnormalities in the liver, which ha don't have that natural background of, of high signal to noise, we, we should not be doing low dose because we would not be able to see those findings. Okay, so one has to design the protocol by which we uh, perform the study, whether it is a dose issue, whether it is how thick the sections are, based upon the indication. We can perform very low dose studies for screening because we're trying to find nodules. But when we're looking for other things, doing low dose where there's a lot of noise in those images may make it impossible for us to f see other important abnormalities. So, so I would say that you know, in, the, in the thorax, it, we can do low dose. For an abdomen and pelvis, much more difficult. But we no. tend not to do the low dose right, when we're following for people with a known cancer history. Typically not, because we are not only just interested in the lungs, we are interested in the mediastinum. We're looking for nodal disease in the mediastinum. We are looking for abnormalities in the liver, which are at the bottom of the chest CT. So, so we tend not to do dedicated low-dose study in patients with a known history of cancer. The so Bill, the next one, we get back to you, all right? Um, and to me, actually. So this is a question about for people who have stage four lung cancer, and are on EGFR targeted therapy, ideas about, well, when do you think about switching? When do you think about adding in SABR? When do you think about adding things to it? And so I can answer part of that, which is that in general, we're monitoring patients pretty closely with scans every two, three, four months to get a sense of, is the treatment that they're on still keeping the cancer stable? And if the cancer starts to grow in a significant way, slow growth, not necessarily do we need to make a change, but if it starts to grow in a significant way, that's when we need to start thinking about making a switch. So if someone's on an earlier EGFR drug, we'll often think about switching to the next generation EGFR drug or to chemo. 
We don't add the immune drugs to the targeted drugs because in the initial trials of that, it looked pretty toxic. So there are trials going on trying to figure out how to do that, but we wouldn't be doing that routinely yet. Um, there is a lot of work trying to understand that interplay and what can we add together. We might be able to add immune drugs with chemo, um, and that's sometimes done as well. And then the role of radiation in that setting. Sure. So this is something that you know is a rapidly, I think, evolving area in terms of kind of the concept behind it. Uh, but just backing up one step, so uh, you know, radiation like uh, surgery uh, is a local treatment modality. So we're treating specific targets, uh, and so the question is always, what is the goal of the treatment? Um, uh, when the cancer is already widespread, local therapies may still have a role in terms of treating a particular area that is threatening or causing, uh, threatening to cause or causing a symptom. It's blocking something. It's causing pain somewhere. Uh, but if the idea is to uh, try to eliminate all of the cancer, you know, um, treating a few spots out of many, you know, is uh, is is not um, you know a, a productive strategy. Uh, but the situation we're talking about here is one where uh, you may have a drug therapy that's working well. All of the tumors are responding, uh, and we want to get the maximum mileage out of that. Uh, and at the point where we see the cancer start to grow again, so this is that oligoprogressive concept that um, I touched on earlier, uh, the question is, is it growing everywhere? Uh, indicating that, you know, really the only way to address it is with a new drug strategy. Um, or in some cases, could it be growing in just, you know, one spot or a few spots, suggesting that maybe there's a, a new mutation developing, but it's starting at one place. It's not in all of the tumors at once. Uh, and in that situation, uh, using a local therapy like radiation to, uh, to ablate the one area where the resistance may be emerging could be a way of extending the usefulness of the existing therapy. And now we have some data um, as I mentioned, it's still very, you know, uh, limited and early, but there, there's a proof of concept that this idea may work, uh, that uh, you can, um, <coughs> in those examples I showed, actually double the time of usefulness of the existing line of therapy. And that's worth a lot, uh, because the longer you can go on one line of therapy, uh, the more chance that you have of, um, you know, being eligible for newer therapies that may be coming down the line. Uh, so, I, I, th I think that's an emerging concept that we're still uh, kind of developing. Okay, then we have a test of uh, a question how to test for PDL1. So, that's a, a test that's done by the pathologist on biopsy specimen. People are working on ways of being able to do that testing through blood tests, but there's nothing that's really standard right now. Another question about um, maintenance chemotherapy. So people who are on chemotherapy, we tend with the targeted drugs or with chemotherapy to keep going um, for metastatic disease as long as the treatment is working for someone and they're tolerating it. So the amount of time is somewhat variable. For earlier stages, they're much more finite periods of time. And then a question about imaging and frequency and um, with, with PET scans. So in metastatic disease, we will get PET scans, but we try to limit not to do too many. I think maximum three year, two to three years is kind of what we try to limit. For early stage and recurrence, we really try not to get a lot of PET scans because a lot of times they, they can lead us into questions because they're very rarely completely normal. If you tense a muscle up, it's going to light up on a PET scan. If your bowel is particularly active, it's going to light up on a PET scan. There are a lot of false positives, but I don't know if anyone else wants to talk about the role of, of PET scans and how frequently we're getting those. Uh, well, I think it's an area of a lot of controversy. Um, I think because uh, there's not data, you know, strong data, you know, for any particular imaging method in terms of surveillance of cancer. Um, so uh, the, uh, the ideal goal that we want to achieve with uh, imaging and surveillance of cancer is uh, to pick up recurrences uh, that, uh, that, you know, uh, are clinically meaningful to intervene on earlier. Um, and particularly in lung cancer, historically, uh, you know, it's been the case, you know, I think the strategy or the, the mindset about lung cancer historically has been quite nihilistic because there haven't been many good treatment options. If you pick up a metastasis sooner rather than later, there's not a whole lot you can do to really alter the natural history of the uh, disease. 
But that's changing. Uh, that's changing because the drug therapies are better. That's changing because there are less invasive, less toxic, um, you know, local therapies that can be brought into play earlier uh, to prevent symptoms before they happen and so on. Uh, but the data in terms of proving that that improves survival uh, or other, you know, measures that we have aren't all there yet. So I think it's, it's in flux. Um, you know, in my own practice, I tend to uh, use PET scans as part of the surveillance more than many people. Um, as of, you know, right now, I can't, you know, show you lots of data to say that that, is, you know, is a, is a proven, you know, um, superior strategy uh, than uh, another. Um, but, uh, you know, I find it useful. But there's, uh, there isn't one, you know, kind of universal standard right now. Okay. So we have five minutes and lots of these left, so I'm going to go through them. We're going to do short answers. Okay. Um, so role of radon in development of lung cancer, definitely, but it's a very small percentage of those people who get lung cancer, probably 3 to 5% at most. Um, okay. Uh, questions about diet, which is never a short answer. Um, so we always get asked about role of sugar, role of meat, role of other things, and we really, it's a very difficult question to answer because there are many, 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 many studies, none of them done in a way that we think of as being a randomized trial where we can look at it and feel like by seeing that data we know the truth. Um, and so a lot of theories around it. Um, what I talk to my patients about is all of us are going to do better by probably eating a little less sugar, by probably limiting some of our animal-based proteins but not necessarily to go to extremes. And it's gonna depend a lot on the person and what they're dealing with as well. Um, if a patient is very ill from their cancer and losing a lot of weight, the last thing they wanna do is try to follow a very, very strict diet because that's gonna probably lead to more weight loss. If they're otherwise doing well and it's something that they really feel good about doing, I, they're, they're, there likely is some benefit, but we just don't know how much. Um, the one thing I do react a little bit to is the sugar comment with this idea, well, you know, PET scans light up, other things, but the truth is all of our cells depend on sugar. That's the energy source of the cells. Cancer cells are very good at taking the nutrients out of the rest of our body. Um, and so I, I talk to people about trying to focus on feeding the rest of them, feeding the healthy cells, and not focusing too much on, on extremes of diet, unless that's helping. I don't know if you all have different thoughts about it. And, and it's really, there isn't a lot of data. There are people looking at this, and some people feel very, very passionately about it. And I think that that's something that's again, becomes very individual. I'm looking around the room, and I think everyone in the room should eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I tell all my patients. Like the I tell all my patients, except my overweight patients, to eat a lot and just okay. eat well, and don't worry about what they eat. All right, uh, and then we had a question about symptoms of lung cancer. Quite variable. Definitely, some people with lung cancer have coughing and shortness of breath. Other people have no idea they have cancer until they have a seizure or they happen to get an x-ray because they're getting a knee replaced. So there's a lot of variability and a lot of variability also in where can the cancer go? Unfortunately, I've seen lung cancer go pretty much everywhere. Uh, it depends on the patient. In different people, the cancer cells figure out to grow in the brain. Some people never does. Sometimes bone, some people never does. Sometimes a muscle, mostly never does. So it's quite variable. There's not one pattern that's definite. Um, specific questions, um, there are a few that are very specific about people's individual cases and we can't really go through those necessarily, but we can stand back and, you know, if you have a particular question. I think we've talked a lot about the ground glass nodules and sort of various ways of dealing with that. It depends on the pattern of growth. It's probably something, if you have questions, we do have a tumor board. We meet every Tuesday. A lot of the patients that we're looking at at that do have these ground glass nodules and we kind of come up with treatment strategies. Um, Clinical trials, lots of them ongoing. Questions specifically about T cells, nanodrugs, um, the, the CAR T cells, they a lot of recent press, especially in leukemia management. Still pretty early for the lung cancers and other solid tumors, some early trials ongoing, but hard to say yet. Um, this is a good question. What do you do, so the scan, standard guidelines for someone with stage one, or two cancer, it's been cured, it's five years. We know up until that point how often to get imaging. After five years, what do we do? So that's been a particular question I've wanted to ask for a while. So I've been working with one of our statisticians and some imagers, trying to get a sense of what's the probability, are there factors that help us know. Um, 
I'm tending to now recommend that for my people, who, my patients who are, um, have gotten to that five-year mark, we're still recommending scans once a year, or every two years. I don't know if the panel wants to comment on that. Well, I think it's an area where there's not a lot of data, but it's sort of reasonable if we're going to be doing, um, it becomes a screening question at, at that point. You know, they no longer have cancer, but they are at risk of developing another lung cancer if they've had one. Um, so we screen high risk populations, and certainly somebody who's had a prior lung cancer falls in a high risk category. I've been looking at too. Great. Okay, well, that brings us to a little bit after eight. So we're going to stop, but we'll be happy to stick around for some specific questions. And again, remember it's Lung Cancer Awareness Month. We wanted to thank everybody. And uh, what am I doing? Oh, and then the, we've got a great group of coordinators over there, clinical trial specialists, happy to answer all sorts of questions about clinical trials. And please do your evaluations. Thank you.